Amen. I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles and, uh, or your Bible app and turn to the book of Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 is our text for today. It's our text for the series, Character 101. And uh, a lot of you are getting familiar with that. And if you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1,158 and you will find Galatians chapter 5. And as always, if you don't have a Bible and you need a Bible, then take one of these with you. We want you to have the Word of God, read the Word of God, because we know if you do that, God will change your life. Uh, it was interesting, last night there was a man leaving, his first time here, and, uh, and he stopped to talk, and I saw that he had one of the Bibles. I said, oh, you got one of the Bibles, that's awesome. And he's like, is it okay? <laughs> I go, yeah, we, we said one should take it, and if you need it, it's okay, as long as you don't take it down to the you know, swap meet and sell it. Uh, we're good with that. So uh, if you need one, please uh, take one. Hey, let me tell you about a couple of things I'm really excited about while you're uh, finding Galatians 5 and getting settled in. Uh, first of all, I had the privilege, the honor of going to Colorado Springs this last week to uh, the headquarters of Outreach Ministries, where they recognized Calvary as one of the 100 fastest growing churches in America in this last year. And uh, yeah, kind of cool. I've shared that a little bit before, but they hadn't told us what ranking we were. And so I showed up thinking, 99 sounds good, you know, honestly. And so I was stunned and delighted when they announced that uh, we were the 29th fastest growing church in America last year. Is that crazy or what? I mean, here we are in Lake Havasu and God is changing lives. God is doing a work and God is, is growing churches and changing. It, it just is amazing what God is doing. So uh, this morning, if you don't think God can really do much or you're hopeless, I just want you to have hope because God can do anything uh, and he's doing it, and we get to see that up close here at Calvary. Now, uh, the other reason I'm excited is because of the Saturday, Serve Our Schools, is coming about. By the way, the, one of the reasons I think that uh, God's been blessing Calvary the way that he has is because we are committed to serving our community. You know, Jesus said, if you want to be great, be the servant of everyone. And, and we're li trying to live that out in our community with our neighbors uh, by serving the schools of Lake Havasu. And we've been inviting you to be a part of this. And whether you've signed up or not, I'm still inviting you to come on Saturday and be a part. Right now, we have over 80 projects completed or committed to. And so we're close to that 100. I think we're going to reach it because I think people are going to show up. But, but I, by the way, I want you to show up not just to help us work. We, I, I like people to help me work, okay? I'm just going to admit that. I'm a little bit lazy, and so I want some help. But, uh, but here's the other reason. Uh, we're going to have a party. I mean, this is, this is going to be a lot of fun. This is going to be like the largest service project event in the history of Havasu to date. Uh, you know, we're aiming for 1,000 volunteers, and I don't want you to miss out on that. I want you to come and experience the joy of serving others and blessing our schools. And, uh, and, and our, our team that's been, you know, putting this event together uh, has actually uh, gotten restaurants in town to donate food for every school. So it's going to be a real party. We're going to eat and everything. And, and I know what some of you are thinking right now. Which restaurants are sponsoring which schools? Because you're going to go to that, you know, it's my favorite restaurant. I'm going to go to that school. And hey, look, we're not going to tell you, okay? That's just how it is. You're not going to know which one, so you can't do And some people have already started talking about a road trip around, and we're okay with that. You can come around to each school and see what food offering they have as long as you do one project at each place, okay? So uh, if you're up for it, we're up for it. It's all going to be good. But really, honestly, we're going to have a great time blessing the, the, the students, the teachers, the schools of Lake Havasu, and I really do. Uh, I want everyone to be a part because it's such an awesome thing to serve the living God. So... Uh, how many of you have siblings? You got brothers or sisters? Okay, grew up, okay, a lot of hands go up. How many of you have older siblings? No, okay, the majority of the hands go up. How many of you had a mean older sibling? <laughs> Not as many hands went up, oh, okay. How many of you were the mean older sibling? <laughs> Thank you for that confession, I appreciate that. Makes me feel so much better that you guys recognize that. See, I have three brothers. Two of them are older, one is younger, and my oldest brother was mean. I mean, he was mean. I mean, he was hit me for no reason other than the fact I existed mean. Took delight in tormenting me uh, as a child. I'm talking about mean enough so that I lived every day of my childhood wondering if today was a day my brother was going to kill me, okay? We didn't have a single real conversation until we were both adults, and so I understand mean. Uh, 
Now, thankfully, God is redeemed. And so in case you're you know, wondering how that relationship is, my mean oldest brother and I are friends, and God has changed both of us, and he has been kind to me as we've grown up. Uh, but uh, today we're continuing our Character 101 series, talking about the characteristics, the traits that God wants to build in our lives. And we've been looking at Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And uh, by now, if you've been coming, you should be able to kind of quote it with me, but you can still look at the text if you want, page 1158 in the Pew Bibles. It says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Um, so if you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for sins, and that he was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then the Holy Spirit in you is trying to teach you these characteristics. And today we're talking about kindness. Kindness. The fruit of the Spirit is kindness. Uh, now, kindness doesn't get a lot of respect. I, I just honestly, uh, in the churches I've grown up in, it was an afterthought. It was undervalued. It was unappreciated. It, it was really kind of ignored. Uh, and it was evident. Because I grew up with mean. I'm an expert in mean. I already shared that with you from my childhood. Uh, and I, one thing I noticed growing up is there are lots of mean people in churches. And tragically, a lot of them are in leadership in churches. Unfortunately, I, I've, I've heard stories from people through the years, because uh, I've been you know, pastor for over 25 years, and, and I've heard stories of people who just have been hurt and broken and abused by churches, by leaders in those churches. And, and it breaks my heart because what that means is a lot of us talk about God's word without applying God's word. A lot of us know what God says to do. We just don't live what God says to do. And that leaves us powerless and honestly guilty of the accusation of being hypocrites. So the first thing I want you to grasp today is the significance of kindness. The significance of kindness. God the Holy Spirit is trying to develop kindness in you. He's trying to teach you kindness. It is not optional. It is not unimportant. It is significant to your character development in Christ. And so the Holy Spirit wants to develop kindness in you because kindness reflects the character of God. Kindness reflects the character of God. Uh, I would invite you to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2, but if, you don't have to. It's the next page, okay? I mean, if you've got a Bible like mine, it's just right there. You don't even have to turn anything. You, if you don't have a Bible like mine, you might have to actually turn a page. Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 4, same Apostle Paul that wrote the fruit of the Spirit writes, writes this. He says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. See, God is righteous, God is holy, God is the judge, but God is the Savior and God is kind. And so here's the gospel in a nutshell. All of us in this room, we're sinners. We have rebelled against God. We've decided that we're going to live life our way instead of God's way. And so we have defied him and, and we have, uh, we've sinned. And because of our sin, every one of them in this room deserves hell. Scripture says the wages of sin is death. And so we've all earned the right to go to hell. Justice would be eternal damnation for all of us. Okay, that's just reality. But God looked on us with kindness, and instead of saying, well, let them get what they deserve, he sent Jesus into this world to suffer and die on the cross to pay for your sins and my sins. Literally, when he was dying, he took our punishment on himself, and he died in our place so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be set free, so that we could become sons and daughters of God by faith in Jesus. 
And so he, his kindness leads him to in, be involved in our lives, to draw us to himself, to give us life even though we deserve death. And so the, the gospel, the good news in a nutshell is this. Even though we defied God, God sent Jesus to save us so that we could have heaven when we deserve hell. That's amazing. Aren't you glad God didn't leave us to justice? Aren't you glad that God said, hey, you know what, they're worth saving and, and, and it doesn't stop there. Just because, you know, we get to that point where we confess Jesus as Lord, God still is kind towards us. In Romans chapter 2, the Apostle Paul says God's kindness leads us to repentance. Leads us to repentance. What does that mean? That means that, you know, even though we're followers of Christ, we still defy him. We still rebel. We still do, you know, our self-destructive actions. And God doesn't just say, ah, oh, fine, just, 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 you know, just get what you deserve. No, he's still involved in us, and the Holy Spirit inside of us is calling us to come back, and he's trying to get us to repent. That's why if you're you know, a follower of Jesus and you're really rebelling, it's not as much fun because the Holy Spirit is, is in you saying, hey, 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 knock it off. Come on. There's better things for you. And, and he's trying to get us to repent and come back home because he wants us to walk away from our self-destructive urges. And step into the life that Jesus has for us because God is kind. He loves you, he values you, and he's led you to the truth out of the kindness towards you. So kindness reflects God's character. That's why it's important. And kindness is central to our mission. Kindness is central to our mission. Uh, what is Calvary's mission? Uh, we try to communicate that on a regular basis. We put it on the wall out in the, the main lobby. Have you guys noticed the wall out in the main lobby with the giant words printed on it? We try to make it really conspicuous so you can't miss it. There are some of you in this room I know are going to walk out there and go, there's words on that wall? <laughs> You're going to go look after the service. Yes, there's words. It says this, Calvary exists to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, the second half of our mission statement, which couldn't fit on the wall because we ran out of space, is this. Calvary exists to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus through the love of his people and the power of his truth. See, the, the what is we want to lead people to Jesus. The how is through the love of his people and the power of his truth. Because people will listen to the truth of God if we show them the love of God. You see, the love of God's people is seen in our kindness. If we want to successfully influence our family, our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ, then kindness is essential. And here's what that means for us. And I've, and I've tried to, to put this in, in a simple way that you can take it home with you and, and remember it. Kindness means no jerks for Jesus. Okay? No jerks for Jesus. We don't, we don't want you to walk out these doors and be a jerk uh, trying to tell everybody how good God is when you treat them awful. See, you can't talk about God's love and treat people like garbage and expect them to respect Jesus. Let me say that again because I want you to, to think about this. You can't talk about God and treat people like trash and expect them to respect Jesus. It's not going to happen. They need to see the kindness of God through your actions, through my actions. They need to see the love of God. And this is core to our mission, that we walk out these doors and be kind. And, and folks, it starts with your family. Be kind to your family. Be kind to your spouse. Be kind to your kids. And, and be kind to your friends. But don't stop there. Be kind to the waiters and waitresses that are going to take care of you when you leave here and go to, go to lunch. Yeah, you know, how hypocritical is it for us to, to leave here celebrating God's goodness and then go be mean to a waiter or waitress because they get an order wrong or because the kitchen is slow? It doesn't make any sense at all. And, and I've known way too many wait staff who, who pretty much said, hey, you know what, we don't like working on Sundays because Christians can be jerks. I, I, want us, I want us to change that dynamic. I want people to be excited to work on Sundays because they go, hey, the people from Calvary are going to come and, and, and they're going to treat me well and they're going to tip me well and, and they're going to show me kindness. It means that we're kind to, you know, the police officer who wants to talk about our driving habits. <laughs> I mean, he is just doing his job, and uh, most of the time that I've been stopped, I deserve it. See, it, it, we, show, we show kindness to, 
you know, the medical staff that's waiting on us and taking care of us when, when we're in pain. And yes, you're in pain, but that doesn't give you the right to be unkind. It means that we're kind to the people at the DMV. See, I know you're going to go, but I have to wait so long. Yeah, and they have to wait on people who've been waiting so long. So imagine what a difference it makes when you show up and you're kind. And you're thankful and you're grateful for them helping you. You see, we want to show kindness. And, and this is so simple and yet so difficult for us to do. But here's the deal. And, and we'll just kind of agree uh, to this, if you will. Um, we take this so seriously that if you're out in the community and you're wearing a Calvary shirt or a Calvary hat and you're being a jerk for Jesus, we'll just repossess the, the, the clothing. We just, I mean, it's, it's that serious. We just come over there and we just yank it off of you, take it away, uh, go, you're disqualified, you don't get to wear it. Because we, this is central to the mission of Calvary. Because we cannot represent Jesus unless we reflect his character and God is kind. And, and then we need to understand the significance of kindness because meanness just flows out of selfishness and arrogance. Meanness flows out of selfishness and arrogance. And and we know this, but we don't really think about it. We get mean because we're self-centered. We get mean because it's all about me and what I want and, and what I need and my agenda and my plans, and I'm not even worried or thinking about you at all. And if I don't get what I want when I want it, then I, then I just get mean. And we get mean because we're arrogant. We actually believe that we are more important than other people. Now, we would never admit that, we would never say it out loud. We'd never agree that we think that. We just live like it. You see, we act like others exist to serve us, to cater to us, to meet our demands, and we treat other people like objects to get what we want. And oh, if they become obstacles to what we want, we get mean. Uh, kindness flows from humility. Kindness results from humility. The Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 says this, Do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but rather with humility of mind consider others more important than yourself. He doesn't say others are more important than you. He just says treat them like they're more important than you. Now why would you do this? Here's, here's the best reason I can think of. Scripture repeatedly in many places says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Do you want to live your life in opposition to God, active opposition to God, or do you want to live your life so that God is affirming you and supporting you and, and promoting you? Uh, I know which one I want. I, I want to be in that place where God can lift me up and, and celebrate me because I'm considering others more important than myself. If you're arrogant enough to believe that, that really the, the world ought to cater to you, then you're living in opposition to God. So we want to be kind. We want to represent Jesus, but we have so many messed up patterns in our lives. How do we change? How do we grow in kindness? Let's talk about keys to kindness. See, the Holy Spirit is teaching us, coaching us, leading us to be kind. So if you want to develop kindness, God's going to partner with you to develop you as his child. And here's the thing. If you really embrace kindness, and you say, God, teach me kindness, it'll change your life. It'll change your relationships. It'll make them better. It'll, it'll change your marriage. It'll change your family dynamics. It'll change you at work. It, God will show up in your life. This is one of those places where we don't think it's a big deal, but it's a huge deal. Now, also understand these are process changes. There's no magic pill that suddenly makes you kind. If you've been mean all your life and you want to grow in kindness, it's not going to happen instantly. But, but here's the thing. God uh, wants to change how you think about him and how you think about yourself and how you think about others. He wants to alter your heart and your mind so he can change your life. So I'm going to just share three keys to growing in kindness. Here we go. First one is recognize the image of God. Recognize the image of God. This might be the biggest one. And it starts in Genesis chapter 1, the creation account. It says this, verse 27 so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. You and I are created in the image of God. And so is everybody else. So is everybody else. We're made in the image of God. And, and, and if we recognize 
that, that people, all people are made in the image of God, then we understand that all people are valuable. That means everyone from the, the youngest life in the womb to the oldest of the old. Every life is significant and has incredible value because they are loved by God and made by God in his image. And when we recognize God's image in the people that we meet, then we recognize that, that they are created by God for him. See, when, when we stop and realize that God loves them like God loves us, and Jesus died for them just like Jesus died for us, and God is redeeming their life just like God is working in our life to redeem, it, it means that we will treat them differently when we recognize that in every person that we come across in our lives. Um, I hate to break this to you. It's going to disappoint some of you. This may be shocking news to you, but you are not God's favorite. I know some of you might be your mom's favorite, but you're not God's favorite. God doesn't love you any more than he loves other people. And God doesn't love you any less than he loves other people. See, God loves us, all of us, and he wants all of us to thrive. He wants all of us to, to, you know, experience his joy and experience his life. See, God loves you completely. So when we can recognize the value in other people, then we can treat them with dignity and respect all the time. And, and, and when we see that, that God loves them, then we want to help them succeed and become the men and women that God's called them to be. And, and, and when we understand that, that they're valued by God, then we want to comfort them and heal them and teach them because that's what the Holy Spirit does with us. And we want to become extensions of God's love to people because we understand that God values them. Um, that also means that we grasp that the other kids in our children's classes are just as valuable to God as our kids. And we stop lobbying for favoritism for our kids. It means that we realize that the people we work with have families to provide for just like we do. And so we don't stab them in the back to try to get ahead. In fact, we try to help them succeed. It's a whole different way of thinking. And let me just share with you where it's driven from and where... Uh, where God really wants us to, to stop and take notice. Matthew chapter 25 is one of my favorite chapters for parables. Three parables in this chapter. All of them are warning parables. Jesus is warning us about how we're living our life. And, and, uh, and I encourage you to go home and read Matthew 25 uh, and listen to the words of Jesus. But I want to lean into the last parable that he tells, the parable of the sheep and the goats. It begins in verse 31. I don't have time to read it or quote it to you, but here's the, the, the thing that's really important. It, it's a parable where Jesus affirms some and condemns some. And the commonality is this. He says to, to both sets, as you have done this to the least of these brothers of mine, you did it to me. As you treated other people, you treated me. Think about that for a moment. When we look at other people, God wants us to recognize the image of God in them, and he wants us to treat them like we would be treating Jesus. Hey, do you think any of you would get mad at Jesus? Do you think any of you would be rude and disrespectful to Jesus if he were right here in front of you? Do, do you, I, yeah, because we're like, no, because it would like freak us out, right? He's Jesus. No, we're going to treat him with respect and kind. We're going to be thankful and grateful to him. We're, and Jesus says, the way you treat me is the way I want you to treat them. Guys, that's life-changing. If we can think about that, It'll change the way we treat one another. It'll change the way we treat others, especially when other people are mean and nasty to us. Especially then. Uh, so if we're going to be kind, you've got to recognize God's image in others. And then secondly, if you're going to be kind, you've got to realize everyone is struggling. Everyone is struggling. All of us are in the same boat. We're all sinners. We're all broken. We're all hurting. We're all in pain. We've all failed. Uh, and we all need the grace of God to make us whole. Now, theologically, we all go, oh, yeah, we're all sinners. We're all broken. But no, I'm talking about personally. Everyone in this room is broken. Everyone in this room has a story of pain and sorrows that fill their life. We just don't see it in other people. 
You see, we all know our pain. We all know our brokenness. We all know our hurts, our struggles. We just don't realize that people around us are hurting just as bad. See, you look around right now and you go, oh, these people all look fine, right? And they all lie to each other and say, oh, I'm fine. That's not true. The truth is, everyone has a story and it involves pain. It involves loss. It involves disappointment. It involves betrayal. It involves redemption. It involves healing. It involves God's salvation. It involves all of those things. And we just don't know their stories. And what happens is this. We start thinking we're the only ones who are hurting. We're the only ones who are in pain. We're the only ones who are in a battle. It's just about us. And selfishness deceives us into thinking we're alone And so we get consumed with self and we treat other people like they don't have the same pain. Can I just tell you that one of the honors that I get as a pastor is I get to hear people's stories and I am amazed at how you have endured the pain. I'm amazed at how you have survived and recovered and thrived and how God has redeemed your pain. Because, and I say that blanket because I know that every person in this room is hurting and you have a story and whether I've heard it or not, I've heard enough stories to know that God uh, is working in your lives, but everyone has brokenness. Everyone. And we can either give into that temptation and get consumed by our pain and be selfish, or we can be like Jesus. We can be like Jesus who was kind to others even when carrying his cross. Are you willing to be kind to others even when you are bearing your cross? You know, Jesus kind of demonstrated it when he prayed, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. While he was being tortured on a cross. So it changes our perspective when we realize everyone is struggling. And then the third reason, third practice, third uh, way to grow in kindness is to remember that you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. Be kind because you reap what you sow. It's, it's sort of a, uh, I don't know how to put this. It's kind of a, a self-serving reason to be kind, but it works. It's going to bless you when you're kind to others. Proverbs 21, 21 says, Whoever pursues righteousness and kindness will find life and righteousness and honor. So if you want life and righteousness and honor, be kind. I mean, that's kind of what God's saying. Hey, you sow kindness, you're going to reap kindness. And, and we know that this is a scriptural principle that applies to everything. So why in the world wouldn't we be kind? Because... Um, Does anybody here want people to be mean and nasty to them? No, we don't. We kind of like the world to be kind to us, so be kind. A few years ago, I was, uh, actually a lot of years ago, I was talking to this guy, and he was kind of telling me how difficult his life was because everywhere he went, you know, people were just rude and mean and nasty and and wanted to start fights and wanted to get into it and all this kind of stuff. And and about halfway through the story, it just kind of dawned on me like this light bulb went off. I live in the same town as this guy. I go to the same restaurants as this guy, same places of entertainment as this guy. Uh, People are not treating me that way because you reap what you sow. So I want to challenge you to do something. It's a little bit unfair, but and it's hard. I want to challenge you to evaluate your life. You and God have a conversation about you. Invite the Holy Spirit to kind of tell you the truth about you, and and just ask this question, God, am I kind? Are you kind? Maybe you don't know how to answer that, so let me give you some further questions to ask. Do you smile easily and often? Do you say please and thank you a lot? Do you go out of your way for others, or do you only expect others to go out of their way for you? You know, when someone calls you up and asks you to do a favor, do you get irritated in your spirit? But you have no problem when you need a hand to call up a friend and ask. How about this one? Do you have to win every argument, or would you rather win the relationship? And the hardest question to ask, if you'll honestly ask it, what's it like to be on the other side of you? What's it like to live with you, to work with you, to hang out with you? 
Now, if you honestly don't know the answer to that, there are people in your life who can tell you. <laughs> yeah, and some of you are going, yeah, but I don't want to ask them. <laughs> you might need to then. Here's the, here's the key, clue. If you don't really know what it's like to be on this side of you and you ask your family or your friends and they look afraid, <laughs> that's your answer. Just repent and beg for mercy right then. And ask God to change you. Because the fruit of the Spirit is kindness. And we can't represent Jesus unless we reflect his character. And we can't accomplish our mission unless we reflect his character. And we can't bless our families unless we reflect his character. And God wants to teach you and me kindness. Are we willing to learn? Are we willing to let him change our lives? Let's pray.